Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on Isaiah and the book of Isaiah. We get a lot of history in this series and some very significant history in terms of biblical prophecy and so forth. This is lesson number five in that series entitled Noble Prince of Peace. Hmm, wonder who that would be. This is the lesson for January 30 of 2021. And as usual, we will begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we think back to the days of Isaiah, which of course is difficult for us to fully comprehend. They were so long ago, and the situation was so different from what it is now. Help us to understand it better as we study together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jim, I think you have an introduction for us there. Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, who supervised the creation of the first atomic bomb, appeared before a U.S. Congressional Committee. They inquired of him if there were any defense against the weapon. Certainly, the great physicist replied, and that is, Dr. Oppenheimer looked over the audience and said softly, peace. <laughs> wow. <laughs> peace is an elusive dream for the human race. It has been estimated that since the beginning of the recorded history, the world has been entirely at peace only about 8% of the time. During these years, at least 8,000 treaties have been broken. During the half century following the end of the World War I, which was supposed to be the war to end all wars, there were two minutes of peace for every year wow. of war. <laughs> oh. Two <laughs> minutes of peace for every year. Yes. Okay, that's our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sabbath afternoon, January 23. In order to understand these few chapters from the book of Isaiah, we must understand something, as much as we're capable of understanding, of the conditions of Judah and Israel in the days of Isaiah. And we have a clue about that in Isaiah 8. Carrie? I'm reading from Isaiah 8, 20, and verses 21 to 22. The people will wander through the land, discouraged and hungry. In their hunger and their anger, they will curse their king and their God. They may look up to the sky or stare at the ground, but they will see nothing but trouble and darkness, terrifying darkness into which they are being driven. And that's from the Good News Translation of American Bible Society Bible. People had turned away from God so far that they were sacrificing their own children to pagan deities. They were trying to communicate with the dead through occult practices, and the king was taking the gold and silver out of Solomon's temple to try to pay tiglath pileser III of Nineveh, Syria, to get him to attack Syria and Israel so that those nations would not attack Judah. Now, I don't know how you could go much further away from God's plan than yeah. that. So what kind of a message do you think God would try to send to Isaiah in such a situation? Charles? Isaiah 9, 1 to 5. There will be no way for them to escape from this time of trouble. The land of the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali was once disgraced, but the future will bring honor to that, this region. This is not not Israel. Yeah, this would be this would be the center the west se central eastern part of Galilee, what we now call Galilee. Galilee yes, uh, from the Mediterranean eastwards to the land of the other side of the Jordan, and even to Galilee itself, where the foreigners live. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. They lived in the land of shadows, but now light is shining in them. Jesus spent quite a bit of time yes. in Galilee. Um, you have given them great joy, Lord. You have made them happy. They rejoice in what you have done. As people rejoice when they harvest their corn or when they divide captured wealth, for you have broken the yoke that burdened them, and the rod that beat their shoulders. You have defeated the nation 
that oppressed and exploited your people just as you defended the army of Midian. Defeated. Long, De defeated the army. Defeated the army of Midian long ago. The boots of the invading army and all their blood stained, stained clothing will be destroyed by fire. Good news Bible. Wow. Well, so we know the story of the battle against Midian way back in the day of Judges. And they were, they, those enemies of Israel turned and, and fought against each other and destroyed each other. What an incredible contrast between those last few verses of Isaiah 8, which we studied last time, and these first verses of Isaiah 9. In fact, these chapters from Isaiah 8, 21 through Isaiah 12 go back and forth between terrible disasters with God punishing his people to marvelous hopes for a future restoration. How do you suppose these messages were received by the people of Jerusalem at that time? Well, why do you suppose that Isaiah 9, 1 starts out by mentioning the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali? Did did Zebulun and Naphtali mean anything to Isaiah in those days? What had happened to Zebulun and Naphtali by the days of Isaiah? They, they apostatized, just like the rest of the uh, ten tribes of Israel. Okay, okay. They, had been, they had gone into exile. Right. It disappeared. Okay. There, was, right. there was no reason. I mean, if you were from Judah and knowing about what was going on there, you would have said, that, con that country has been, already been destroyed, the people have been deported, et cetera, et cetera. Why, why are we talking about those things? <sighs> yeah. Of course, we know now that the secret was that that was going to be the home of Jesus. Okay. When King Ahaz of Judah asked tiglath Pileser III to attack Israel and Syria, he did so. What a surprise. He was attacking everybody all around yeah. him, conquering the world. So 2 Kings 15, 29, was when, it was while Pekah was king that hid tiglath Pileser, the emperor of Assyria, captured the cities of Ejon, Abel Beth Mecha, Genoa, Kadesh, and Hatzor, and the territories of Gilead, Galilee, and Naphtali, and took the people to Assyria as prisoners. So there is exactly what had happened to those people. We already know. And surely those who heard Isaiah's words, in fact, Isaiah himself, <clears throat> must have wondered when this marvelous delivery would come, which is spoken about in Isaiah 9. And, ha, ha, and how would it come? Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. A child is born to us. A child is given to us. He will be our ruler. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. His royal power will be, continue to grow. His kingdom will always be at peace. He will rule as King David's successor, basing his power on right and justice from now until the end of time. Lord Almighty is determined to do all this. Good News Bible. Okay, well, I wonder if we could guess who that applies to. <laughs> Doesn't it seem like a contradiction in terms, how could a baby boy born to us be wonderful counselor yeah. or counselor, mighty God, eternal father, or <laughs> prince of peace? Well, we do not need to guess about that because Matthew 4, 12 and 17 gives us the answer. Carrie? Okay, I'm reading verses 12 to 17. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he went away to Galilee. And I interrupt there for just a second. This is an important point for us to remember in terms of the chronology of the experience of Jesus on this earth. He, of course, got baptized at the beginning of his ministry for, we don't know really what happened those first six months, but we know then he came to that first Passover, and between the first Passover and the second Passover, he, he worked quietly under the radar in Judea because he knew that if he tried to make any kind of big splash, a big, make himself very obvious, he would immediately be attacked by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and so forth. So by the time of the second major Passover, he was there in Jerusalem and again made himself very obvious at the Passover, and about that same time, John the Baptist was arrested and put in prison. And Jesus says, okay, 
considering what has just happened, it's time for me to move my ministry from Judea to Galilee. He worked in Galilee for about a year. That was the time while John the Baptist was in prison. And when John the Baptist was beheaded, Jesus left Galilee, and that's the time he started traveling in the territories outside of Judea or Galilee, preparing his disciples for the time when he would be gone. So the two major movements in Jesus' ministry happened, first with the imprisonment of John the Baptist, and second with the heading of John the ba beheading of John the so Baptist. So he was in the prison for about a year then? He was in the prison for about so a year. Uh, right now, when he goes to uh, Naphtali, uh, it's about two and a half years into his ministry, it sounds like. Yes. Okay. No, actually it's about a year and a half. Year and when, half. He first, when he first went there, two and a half years when he left there. Oh, okay. Right. Carrie? Continuing, he, meaning Jesus, did not stay in Nazareth, but went to live in Capernaum, a town by Lake Galilee in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was done to make what the prophet Isaiah had said come true. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali on the road to the sea on the other side of the Jordan. Galilee, land of the Gentiles, the people who live in darkness will see a great light. And those who live in the dark land of death, the light will shine. Can I interrupt there for just a second? You notice it calls it on the, what's on the road to the sea? Yeah. It turns out that there's a valley stretching from just outside of, in Sea of Galilee is there, and then you go up over a ridge, and then there's a valley that goes right out to the sea. So if you're traveling from the east and you're coming that direction, you go down, and so the major traffic was through, was through Galilee, and they would go right on and over into the Mediterranean to ship wherever they wanted to ship beyond, beyond uh, Israel. Galilee is below sea level, is it? Gal Galilee is just, a, yeah, it's actually a little below sea level. And then of course, the Dead Sea is way, Jericho is way below sea level. A thousand feet below sea level, more than a thousand feet below sea level. Continuing, from that time, Jesus began to preach his message. Turn away from your sins because the kingdom of heaven is near. That comes from the Good News Bible. And and it's very interesting to notice that the good news, <clears throat> which came when Jesus began his work in Galilee, was not limited to Galilee. How many people were impacted by the teaching and preaching of Jesus, Charles? Matthew 4, 23 to uh, 25. Jesus went all over Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news about the kingdom, and healing the people who had all kinds of diseases and sickness. The news about him spread through the whole country of Syria, so that people brought to him all those who were sick, suffering from all kinds of diseases and disorders, people with demons and epileptics and paralytics, and Jesus healed them all. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the ten towns from Jerusalem, Judah, and the land on the other side of the Jordan. So you can see that there was a huge catchment area all coming to take advantage of the fact that Jesus could heal people. I mean, this we're talking about territory maybe 400 miles across here from the northern part of Syria down to the southern part of Idumea um, and down the, the ten towns, the other side of Jordan and so forth. That was a huge area and I'm sure the word just spread. You know, if you, if you can get to Jesus, hey, Yes. He can so touch you and make you well. Those ten towns were... The ten Iker. towns, what are sometimes called Decapolis, right. they were on, all but one of them were on the other side of the Jordan River. But Jesus was already there um, meeting with this lady at Jacob's well. Sounds no, like that's, that's in Samaria. Okay. The, that, that, okay. This okay. If, if you draw a map towns. here, let's draw it this way. Okay. Um, here's Galilee. Okay. There's Samaria in the middle. There's Judea down here, okay? The ten tribes, now I'm drawing it backwards for you. Here, let me do it this way. So here's, here's Galilee, Samaria, Judea. Over here is, well, here's the Jordan River down here, and of course, Galilee, I mean, the Sea of Galilee is up here. Down here is the Dead Sea. If you cross over on this side, there's, that's a territory which was largely Gentile territory, known as Decapolis. They were Greek cities. 
that were lined up and down all the way from from almost up uh, close to get uh, close to Damascus and Syria, all the way down to south of south of Jerusalem, south so of these Jericho. Ten cities are different from the the ten other cities where. The so Decapolis is is. Decapolis. There were all ten on the east side of the Jordan. All but one. There's one of them that was just barely across the Jordan River on the west side. Okay. Just one. So yeah, they're they're scattered mm. you know, down across through the crust there. Yeah. Because the demon possessed uh, gentleman went and went all over uh, the uh, the ten, ten. Ten. That's what it says. Uh, I don't know how much time he spent in different places, but. Of course, he was, the place where he was initially was just east of, just east for you over here, of the, of the southern tip of the Sea of Galilee. Because they landed, remember, they, they crossed the sea, yes. landed their boat, and bang, there, he was, there was two of them. Yes. Right, because one, I think once you mentioned that uh, uh, when the disciples, after Jesus was gone, would go through those same towns because they were already believers. Yes. Well, and the other thing we need to remember about that is when the people of Galilee wanted to travel to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. they instead of tri trying to travel through Samaria, they would cross the Jordan River just south of the Sea of Galilee, travel down through the ten, tri uh, ten cities there, the, 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 the capitalists, until they got across from Jericho, cross the Jordan River again, to Jericho and then walk that steep hill up from Jericho to Jerusalem just so they wouldn't have to go through Samaria. Yeah, crazy. Jesus, of course, grew up in Galilee. The, were, were the Christians, I mean, followers of Christ who were doing this or this was before? No, this was the Jews, before, before, was, before yeah. there were any Christians. Right, yeah. Yeah, but now remember, during those last six months of Christ's life, he, because of the opposition from the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were determined to catch him and kill him, he stayed out of Jewish territory. Mm -hmm. He spent his time in those other cities over there and some time in Samaria. So it talks about him traveling some in Samaria, but most of his time, so he was over there in that territory over there when, when uh, Lazarus died, when they sent a message for him, Lazarus said, so he had to come from the other side of Jordan, cross the Jordan, up to Bethany, healed him, and then escaped back to the other side so, he, so that the priests and rulers wouldn't arrest him and kill him. Yeah. Well, of course, we know that when his ministry actually started in Galilee, he moved from Nazareth to Capernaum. And of course, the people in Nazareth, what did they do to him? They wanted to throw him down off the cliff, remember? Yes. Mark. Because he'd, he he. He, he was audacious enough to say, I'm the Messiah. Yes. It was a time when he chose his disciples. That's one of the first things he did in his Galilean period. And began training them for what was coming. And in Galilee, he was more removed from the power of authorities in Jerusalem, and thus a little safer. <laughs> Last week, he studied about the birth of that baby, there and mentioned in Isaiah 9, 6 especially. Uh, we suggested that the prophecy in Isaiah 7.14 had a dual application. One in the days of Isaiah, and we're suggesting that, we suggested that the, what, the baby who ended up being called Mehershal al-Hashbaz was supposed to have been called Emmanuel. But because the people refused to turn to God, turn back to God, he got the name Mehershal al-Hashbaz instead. And the second major fulfillment, of course, of the Isaiah 7.14 prophecy came with the birth of Jesus to the Virgin in New Testament times. It's interesting to know that, notice that the lesson for this week mentions the birth of Emmanuel, but does not suggest who that was in the days of Isaiah. Isaiah, of course, did, did have two prophetic sons, Sheher Jashub and Meher Shalal Hashbaz and we studied about their names and what they all meant and so forth last time. But clearly, the prophecy in Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 cannot refer to anyone except the baby born to a virgin in Bethlehem. As we read through the Isaiah 9 and 10, we note that this brief notice about a baby comes in the midst of terrible punishments falling upon the disobedient Israelites. But it, it had a dual purpose but the first one really never was applied then. It never, the, see, the, the idea was, remember that Isaiah said to the king, 
Ask for anything you want. God will give you anything as a sign. I mean, why didn't Isaiah, I mean, why didn't the king just say, well, help me to drive out the Israelites and the, and, and the Syrians? I mean, that's what he was worried about. But no, he said, I'm not going to ask the Lord for a sign. And so the whole nation, none of the nation really turned to God. And so instead of saying, here's the baby coming to represent that God is with us, Emmanuel, he has to get this name, Mayor Shal Hashbaz, which means quick, quick, loose, fast plunder, because they didn't turn to God. Okay? Had other Old Testament prophets said anything about this Messiah to come? Notice this very interesting passage from Desire of Ages. This is the story of the people rejoicing as Jesus made that triumphal entry into Jerusalem five days before his crucifixion. Charles, I think that's yours. As the question... So here they are. Remember, they're, they're, Jesus is on that colt, riding that colt of a donkey, and they are sure that they're... they're leading him into Jerusalem, they're going to crown him king. Okay? And this is, this, this is what they're shouting. As they question, who is this? The disciples, filled with the spirit of inspiration, answered this question. In eloquent strains, they repeat the prophecies concerning Christ. Adam will tell you, it is the seed of the woman that shall bruise the serpent's head. Genesis 3.15. Ask Abraham, he will tell you, it is Melchizedek, king of Salem, king of peace, Genesis 14, 18. Jacob will tell you his silo of the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49, 10. Remember, that's that famous time when Jacob brought all his sons together and said, I'm about to die, and here are the prophecies for each one of you. Isaiah will tell you, Emmanuel, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace, Isaiah 7, 8, 14, 9, 6. Jeremiah will tell you the branch of David, the Lord our righteousness, Jeremiah 23, 6. Daniel will tell you he is the Messiah, Daniel 9, 25, 26. Hosea will tell you he is the Lord God of horse, the Lord is his memorial. Hosea 12.5, John the Baptist will tell you, He is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. John 1.29, The great Jehovah has proclaimed from His throne, This is my beloved Son. Matthew 3.17, We, His disciples, declare, This is Jesus, the Messiah, the Prince of Life, and the Redeemer of the world, and the Prince of the powers of darkness, acknowledges him, saying, I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God, Mark 1, 24. This is from Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 578. Very good. I love that passage. I mean, here is people, you know, over a thousand year, 1400 year period. In fact, if you go all the way to Adam, back to Adam, thousands of years. Boom, boom, these prophecies predicting the coming of the Messiah. Unfortunately, we have to read what, we, what comes next. Clearly, someone in that crowd had become familiar with the Old Testament prophecies. And so, I want you to think about that. What do, you, do you suppose they studied those passages in the Hebrew schools? Yeah, they might have. They probably did. Who knows? Sure they did. Yeah. Absolutely. They were supposed to, the really good students were supposed to have memorized the Old Testament in Hebrew by the time they graduated from basically about from high school. Daniel Remember, did. Daniel yeah. did. Yeah. And his three buddies did. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so here's all these prophecies. They knew them. But at the time Jesus was born, the situation was very different. And I'm quoting, an angel visits the earth to see who are prepared to welcome Jesus. But he can discern no tokens of expectancy. He hears no voice of praise and triumph that the period of Messiah's coming is at hand. The angel hovers for a time over the chosen city. What's the cho where's the chosen city? Bethlehem. Jerusalem. No, Jerusalem would be, in this case, the chosen city. That, that's true. Yes. And the temple where the divine presence had been manifested for ages. But even here is the same indifference. 
So that person who had been the one enshrined in the most holy place in Solomon's temple is now about to be born in Bethlehem. And nobody's paying any attention. Yeah, that's right. The priests in their pomp and pride are offering polluted sacrifices in the temple. The Pharisees are with loud voices addressing the people or making boastful prayers at the corners of the streets. In the palaces of kings, the assemblies of philosophers, and the schools of the rabbis, all are alike unmindful of the wondrous fact which has filled all heaven with joy and praise that the Redeemer of men is about to appear upon the earth. There is no evidence that Christ is expected and no preparation for the Prince of Life. In amazement, the celestial messenger is about to return to heaven with the shameful tidings when he discovers a group of shepherds who are watching their flocks by night. And as they gaze into the starry heavens are contemplating the prophecy of the Messiah to come to earth and longing for the advent of the world's Redeemer, do you want to say hallelujah, right? Mm -hmm. Here is a company that is prepared to receive the heavenly message. And suddenly the angel of the Lord appears declaring the good tidings of great joy. <laughs> Celestial glory floods all the plain. And Ellen White says, he appeared, the angel first appeared to them just by himself. He didn't want to completely blind them. He just appeared until their, until their eyes sort of got used to the glory. And then all of a sudden, whoosh, imagine the whole sky is full of bright shining angels. Yeah. Hmm. And as if the joy were too great for one messenger to bring from heaven, a multitude of voices break forth in the anthem which all the nations of the saved shall one day sing, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Luke 2.14, Ellen White, Great Controversy. 3.14, 1 and 2. I, I, I wonder what those shepherds said to their families the next morning when they went home. Yeah. How did they describe the voices of the angels and the singing of the choir. <laughs> Ever asked yourself that question? But didn't they that same night go and they went. see? The they went and found the baby. Yes. I don't know whether wow. someone had to stay behind and watch the, the, the flock. <laughs> who knows? This is, we yeah. don't care. We're I running. mean, who cares? The Messiah is <laughs> here, right? The Messiah is here. Yeah, right? wow. A uh, little question, side question, timeline. Yeah. Do you think that the Magi had already come about that time to Herod? Or was it I have looked at that and looked at that and looked at that. No, they had not already come. They didn't come till after he was born, but how long after he was right. born, we don't know. Okay. Yeah. It, was, yeah. it was pretty quick, but we don't know how quickly. So when the shepherds saw the, heard the angels sing, and mm -hmm. uh, see that uh, probably not that Herod was the, I mean, no, no. Uh, they imagine it did he, he didn't know anything about that yet. Because it, I, you have been there, so I, mm -hmm. Bethlehem is what uh, three Beth miles or something. Yeah, or? no, it's it's about five or six, but five not, or six not very far. Not very far. Okay. Yeah. We know that Jesus was not an ordinary human being. He was the creator of everything, and there's passages there: John one, uh, one to three, and fourteen. Um, Colossians 1, 15 to 17, and 2, 9, Hebrews 1, 1 to 3, some marvelous passages there about how Christ is the creator of all. This Jesus came not only to save us, but also to become an eternal part of the human family. Unto us a child is born forever. That's what the New Testament tells us. When the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit planned together for the salvation of the human race, they knew how difficult it was going to be to deal with Satan's rebellion. Jim? When Christ came in, excuse me, when Christ came to our world, Satan was on the ground and disputed every inch of advance in his path from the, man, from the manger to Calvary. Satan had accused God of requiring self-denial of the angels when he knew nothing of what it meant himself. When he would not... When, and when he would not himself make any sacrifice for others. And just this, imagine that. Satan's, one of Satan's first claims against God is, well, you're nothing special. You don't, you've never made any self-sacrifice. I mean, you know, just incredible. This was the accusation that Satan made against God in heaven. After the evil one was expelled from heaven, he continually charged the Lord with exacting service, which he would not render himself. 
Christ came to the world to meet these false accusations and to reveal the Father. Okay. Ellen White, Review and Arrow, February 18, 1890. And you could also put in there John 17, 3 and 4. Oh, yes. And John 17, 4, I have accomplished the work you gave me to do. I have made known your character. Yep. Of course, John, uh, John 14, 9, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And we're going to read, Carrie's going to read us some passage here that says, that was Christ's major task. Look at it. The major task that Jesus had when coming to this earth was, Carrie? At Christ's coming, the law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions, and God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, arbitrary. He was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the sufferings of his creatures. The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one, represented as belonging to the character of God. And I'm going to interrupt for a second. Can you imagine picturing God who could take pleasure in the sufferings of his creatures? Where does that idea come from? Can you think of anybody having said anything like that? Well, you, the friends of Job talked that way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and what do people, what do people to, even today say about hell? Oh, yeah. It, Burn forever. Always. Yeah, it, it, it makes God happy b right. because he's burning sinners. Yes. yes. Sinners yes. in the hands of an angry God, yeah. uh, Jonathan really? Edwards. Yeah. Jonathan Edwards, wow. Okay, Carrie. I'm sorry, I lost my place. Where? The very attributes. The very attributes. Okay. I'm looking at here. Okay, I'll keep going. I think I've got, there's more here than I thought, okay. which is all right. The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one represented as belonging to the character of God. Jesus came to teach men of the Father. To there we have it again. Jesus came to teach men of the Father. And to, repre and to correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. There it is again. Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was a living impersonation of God, there could, it is again. could not fail to accomplish the work. The only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. There it is again. Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose of his own mission on earth, to set men right through the revelation of God. There it is again. In Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. There it is again. In his prayer just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy name. There it is, Jim. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. There it is again. When the object of his mission was attained, the revelation of God to the world. There it is again. <laughs> the Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and, and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. And again, how many times do you have to say it? And all of the, that whole process is education. Yes. Which is redemption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay? It's not paying a penalty for somebody. No. It's, 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 that's a pagan concept. Yeah. is to educate, and education takes time. Yeah. And you can't force it. You can't sh take any shortcuts. You've got to lead people. And Jesus, well, when he says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father, I call you, uh, no, don't call you servants, I call you friends, yeah. because of everything I learned from my Father, I have made known unto you. Yeah, John and, 13. Yeah, John 15, 15. And what I read... And 15. Well, 13, yeah. okay. What I read came from the signs of the times, and written by Ellen G. White in January 20, 1890. And that text has maybe only once been quoted in the last, what, how many years? Close yeah. to 100 years. I'm trying to make up for that by quoting it every week or two. I'm talking about, I'm talking about in official documents. I know. Would it be that even at uh, Adventist pulpits all over the world that we misrepresent yes. our Heavenly Father? And I mean, that's, that's why... Jesus had to come yeah. because the Old Testament was misrepresenting the character of God. Yeah, and yeah. at least that, especially their interpretation of it. Well, yeah, the, the Old the, Testament might not be a perfect representation, but their interpretation of it was awful. But we have a text to support. Well, two texts, just as what I just said, and that is Jeremiah eight verse eight. 
the scribes have made it into a lie. And in John Matthew 23, Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Seven times, one right after the other. How many people are left out of that bunch? <laughs> are, are, yes, you know, are, are we making me laughing? That's a sad no, it's story. A serious. I, aren't we making that same mistake, perhaps, mm. you know, all over the world? And it's, so. Okay, but having read those marvelous words about the coming Messiah, which was still 700 years in the future in Isaiah's day, we must turn back to the reality in Isaiah's day. And I'm going to read these, Isaiah 9, verse 8 to 10, 4 here. And let me make it a little bit larger so you can read it easier. You can see that I'm not misrepresenting anything that's going on here. The Lord has pronounced you judgment on the kingdom of Israel, on the descendants of Jacob, and the people of Israel, everyone who lives in the city of Samaria. Now that's the northern kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. Who know that he has done this. Now they are proud and arrogant. They say, the brick buildings have fallen down, but we will replace them with stone buildings. The beams of sycamore wood have been cut down, but we will replace them with the finest cedar. The Lord has stirred up their enemies to attack them, Syria on the east and Philistia on the west, to open their mouths to devour Israel. Yet even so, the Lord's anger is not ended, ended. His hand is still stretched out to punish. The people of Israel have not repented, even though the Lord Almighty has punished them. They have not returned to him. In a single day, the Lord will punish Israel's leaders and his people. He will cut them off head and tail. The old and honorable men are the head, and the tail is the prophets whose teachings are lies. And I'm going to drop down to chapter 10. Um, you are doomed. You, might un you make unjust laws that oppress my people. That is how you prevent the poor from having their rights and from getting justice. That is how you take the property that belongs to widows and orphans. So he, that's what he's, he's talking about, what the, people, what the people in the northern kingdom are doing, and that's why they're, they're falling into the, all that problem. While well, people were boasting of how they would strengthen fortifications and build stronger walls, everywhere in the country people snatch and eat any bit of food they can find, but their hunger is never satisfied. They even eat their own children. Your kid dies, so you eat him. God went on to describe how awful things were and what was going to happen. In Isaiah 10, God through Isaiah warned the people of Judah that after Assyria had conquered Israel, uh, Syria and Israel, Assyria would now attack Ju Judah as well. Isaiah 10, 28-32 this en the enemy army had captured the city of Ai. They have passed through Migron. They left their supplies at Mekamesh. They have crossed the pass and are spreading the night at Giba. The people in the town of Rama are terrified and the people in K King Saul's town of Giba have run away. Shout, people of Gilam, Listen, people of Lisha, answer people of Anathoth, the people of Mademe, Made, Mad Mena, Mad Mena, Mena. and Gibam are running for their lives. Today the enemy are all in the town of Mo Nob, and there they are sh uh, shaking their fists at Mount Zion and the city of Jerusalem. Good news, Bible. Okay, here's a real quick trivia question. What's famous about the city of Anathoth? <laughs> That's the hometown of Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. The priests. That's the priestly family that were taken away be after David's and Solomon's debacles with, with, anyway, I won't go into all the details, but that group that had formerly been the high priest family moved to Anathoth and there was a new person was put in place to be the new high priest. So, and Jeremiah was from that, that family that had been deposed, basically. Don't these words sound like Isaiah was reporting on an actual, I mean, you can just see them. He's saying, mm -hmm. here, there, 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 and they're coming, you know. It seems like an actual attack. It seems like the Assyrian military was coming very close to Jerusalem itself. So how do you understand these verses? 
but God promised that a faithful few would survive and come back and that Assyria would be punished. How would you compare these punishments as spelled out in Isaiah with what was prophesied in Leviticus 26, not 14 to 39? We don't have time to read that now, but if you go over there, you find out that God predicts if you disobey and if you go on doing all these things, worshiping all these pagan idols and doing all these terrible things, this is what's going to happen to you. There it is, Leviticus 26. When you get a spare moment, you want to read some terrible stuff, read over there. What was happening in this context? Had God lost his temper? Was he attacking his chosen people? Or did God simply step back from those who did not want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices? While Isaiah 9, 1-7 is a marvelous promise of a future Messiah to come, the rest of the chapter is very scary. How are we to understand the wrath of God as described in Isaiah 9, 10 to 9, 8 through 10, 2? Would the Lord actually stir up their enemies to attack them? Is that ever God's plan? Isaiah 9, 11, it says that. They were not ready to repent, Isaiah 9, 13, and the wickedness of the, of the people burned like a fire that destroys thorn bushes and, and thistles. So now... Give me your words of wisdom. Why is God talking like this? I guess he you are doomed, it, go, it says. Yeah. You make unjust laws that oppress my people. That is how you prevent the poor from having their rights and from getting justice. That is how you take the property that belongs to widows and orphans. You take it from them, basically. Well, okay. I want you to think about this for a moment. What would you have done if you had been God in that situation? Did God need to lash out and punish his people? Or did he just need to allow them to reap the natural consequences of their own evil behaviors? What happens if you sin against God and you keep refusing to him and you keep running away from him as fast as you can go? Let you go. He took away his uh, protection. Your own devices. God has granted us as human beings freedom and liberty. And why is that important? You can't, yeah. Without freedom to choose, there is no love. Right? Without freedom and liberty, there could, we could have no love. And God's kingdom is built on love. So he decided that we must be allowed freedom. So what happens when we choose against him? He lets you go. These chapters give us just a little hint about how God will allow us to face the consequences of wrong decisions, pain, suffering, fear, turmoil, and so forth. Have we learned our lesson? Not looking at the evening news. A remnant, a remnant does. <laughs> yeah. Not when you watch the evening news, Carrie says, yeah. <laughs> well, then in Isaiah 11 and 12 again, we have marvelous promises. Isaiah 11, 1 through 9. Okay, having gone through all that really scary stuff, the royal line of David is like a tree that has been cut down. But just as new branches sprout from a stump, so a new king will arise from among David's descendants. The Spirit of the Lord will give him wisdom and the knowledge and skill to rule his people. He will know the Lord's will and honor him and find pleasure in obeying him. He will not judge by appearance or hearsay. He will judge the poor fairly and defend the rights of the helpless. At his command, the people will be punished and evil persons will die. He will rule his people with justice and integrity. Wolves and sheep will live together in peace. And leopards will lie down with young goats. Calves and lion cubs will feed together. And little children will take care of them. So it's not only taking care of the animosities between human beings, we got problems between animals here. Cows and bears will eat together, and their calves and cubs will lie down in peace. Lions will eat straw as cattle do. Even a baby will not be harmed if it plays near a poisonous snake. On Zion, God's sacred hill, there will be nothing harmful or evil. And what's that? what? Is, how does all this come about? The land will be as full of knowledge of the Lord as the seas are full of water. 
And the knowledge of the Lord is eternal life. John yep. seventeen three. Yeah. Why would God have poisonous snakes in heaven? Well, he's painting a picture. Yeah, he's, he's yeah. painting. I don't. I don't think. I don't think he's going to have poisonous snakes in heaven. Why would he? That's what I wondered. Some of those can kill you. The really poisonous. Quick. The snakes that are poisonous here. Will there be cobras? Perhaps we don't know. I have not seen. Not, probably not, so, but, but they not will not harm. be. They will not be killing. Right. Yeah. So Isaiah 11 turns out to be a gr very great chapter about the future life. It'll be expanded near the end of the book of Isaiah, as we will learn later, and it, it's mentioned several times, a number of times, in the book of Revelation. So keep that in mind, what we just read. Isaiah 11 goes on to say that God's exiled people will actually be able to return. He spelled it out in some detail. They, were even, they would even conquer their enemies on both sides, east and west. So we need to identify this shoot that comes from the stump of Jesse, Isaiah 11, 1. Do we know who the shoot is? Christ. Jesus. That shoot branch. or branch is also mentioned twice in the book of Zechariah. We can look at a couple of verses, Zechariah 3, 8. Then, listen then, Joshua, you who are the high priest, and listen to your, you fellow priests of his, you that are a sign of a good future. I will reveal my servant who is called the branch. I will reveal my servant who is called the branch. And look at chapter 6, verse 12. Tell him that the Lord Almighty says, the man who is called the branch will flourish where he is and rebuild the Lord's temple. Well, so who is that shoot who will come out of what appears to be a dead stump? Why is it that new ru ruler... Why is that new ruler from the house, tribe of David called the root of Jesse? I mean, can you be the root and the branch at the same time? How does that work? Only Christ. Can. Well, this shoot coming up from a stump might remind us of the story of King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4. But this prophecy about the root of Jesse appears again, Revelation 22, 16. Revelation 22, 16. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with, the excuse me, with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Okay, so Art. how could someone be the root and the branch at the same time? Because he is it, the creator. It, it, All human beings are his children. But at the same time, that's on his father's side. On his mother's side, he is a descendant of King David, right? Yeah. yeah. So he's the root and the is a branch. Son of his, a son of himself, or is his yeah. own father? Yeah. yeah. Well, the description fits. Uh, go ahead, Jim. With this the description, the description fits only Jesus, who is both the root and the descendant of David. Revelation twenty-two sixteen of the New Art. Revised Standard Version. Christ came from the line of David, Luke 3, 23 to 31, who was descended from Adam, who was the son of God, Luke 3, 38, in the sense that Christ created him, see John 1, 1 to 3, and verse 14. So Christ was David's ancestor as well as his descendant. Yeah. So the Bible study guide. Okay. Ancestor and descendant. Yep. Very good. It is interesting to notice that this new ruler will not only restore peace in the Middle East, but also he will restore peace between wolves and sheep, leopards and goats, calves and lion cubs, cows and bears. That's a pretty good job, right? Mm -hmm. All the evil that has taken place in our world will eventually be reversed by this baby who turns out to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. How will he accomplish all that, quote, the land will be as full of knowledge of the Lord as the seas are full of water. And what, what do we say about the knowledge of the Lord? To know God is to is eternal, well, love, love him. him. Love him yeah. To know God is to love him. So that's what's going to happen here. If you read carefully through Isaiah 11, it seems like some parts of that chapter are talking about the first coming of Jesus. However, other parts are talking about the second or third comings. It is clear that Isaiah saw those events as if they were a single event. And this is very interesting because 
what you realize, if you study very carefully, is that all through the Old Testament, there's no evidence that anyone realized that there was ever going to be more than one coming. They all looked forward to what they thought was going to be the coming of the Messiah. We cut to the New Testament, all the way through the New Testament up until Revelation 20, all those people believed there was going to be only two comings, the one that's already passed and the second coming, which they were looking forward to. And then all of a sudden, at the very end of John's life, Revelation 20, after all the other apostles are dead, disciples are dead, Paul, Peter, all of them were dead, John gets a message, oh, guess what? Then there's going to be a thousand years, we call a millennium, and then there's going to be a third coming. Yeah. I so think, I think we have a little time. Uh, do other Christians all believe in the third coming? Or? No. 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 Probably none of them. Yeah, well, yeah, there is such a crazy collection of ideas about the millennium. It's just unbelievable. Some people believe that Jesus will come before the second millennium. Some people believe Jesus doesn't come until the end of the, of the millennium. Some people believe Jesus comes at the beginning of the millennium. He rules here on this earth for the whole time, so everything's great. There's a huge variety of beliefs about the millennium. Well, um, read, look at Isaiah 12, 1 to 6, and I think we've got time to read that real quickly. A day is coming when people will sing, I praise you, Lord. You were angry with me, but now you comfort me and are angry no longer. God is my Savior. I will trust him and not be afraid. The Lord gives me power and strength. He is my Savior. As fresh water springs joy to the brings joy to the thirsty, so God's people rejoice when he saves them. A day is coming when people will sing. Give thanks to the Lord. Call for him to help you. Tell all the nations what he has done. Tell them how great he is. Sing to the Lord because of the great things he has done. Let the whole world hear the news. Let everyone who lives in Zion shout and sing. Israel's holy God is great and he lives among his people. Wow. This is a short psalm. It is a song of praise because of God's deliverance. It should be compared with Revelation 15, 2-4 where it says basically the same thing. Jesus Christ has not only dealt with sin and provided us salvation, but also he has broken down the wall of barrier between Jews and Gentiles, between the circumcised and the uncircumcised, and eliminated the reasons for keeping them enemies. But Jesus did more than just solve the problems on this earth. I'm reading from John chapter 12, verses 32 to 33. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. In saying this, he indicated the kind of death he was going to suffer. And that comes from the Good News Bible. When John quoted Jesus saying, I will draw everyone to me, that included the entire universe. How do the life and death of Jesus bring together beings in the entire universe? His life, his death, and his resurrection answer the questions and accusations that Satan had brought against God, starting in heaven itself and later coming down to this earth. Charles? John 12, 32. No. Christ was the one. Christ who... was the one. Sorry. Christ was the one who consented to meet the conditions necessary for man's uh, salvation. salvation. No angel, no man was sufficient for the great work to be wrought. The Son of Man alone must be lifted up, for only an infinite nature could undertake the redemptive process. Christ consented to connect himself with the disloyal and sinful, to partake of the nature of man, to give his own blood, and to make his soul an offering for sin. In the councils of heaven, the gift, guilt of man was measured, the wrath of sin was estimated, and yet Christ announced his decision that he would take upon himself the responsibility of meeting the conditions whereby hope should be extended to a fallen race. Ellen White, Signs of the Times, March 5, 1896, page 6. And that would have been written from Australia. It is clear that many of the Jews in Jesus' day thought that he would, be, he would come as a mighty conqueror 
to free them from Roman rule and to conquer the world. A misreading of Isaiah 11 might lead one to come to that conclusion. Have we accurately understood the prophecies about the second coming and the third coming? Do we understand what happens at each one of those major events? We've talked just briefly about the millennium. That's a thousand years between the second coming and the third coming. Do we understand all the events that happen at the second coming and all the events that happen at the third coming? I hope so. Or are we misinterpreting the events as did the Jews? When God's chosen people finally face the time of trouble and the seven last plagues, might they think that they are in the same kind of problem that Isaiah and those with him in Jerusalem were facing? Isaiah spoke a great deal about light. John 1 agrees. We have already noticed how terrible conditions were in the times uh, written about in Isaiah 8, 22-22. And I quote, In Isaiah's day, the spiritual understanding of mankind was dark through misapprehension of God. So all those quotations we read earlier about Jesus came to bring the light, to, to teach us the truth about God, well, here's why that was necessary. So much misapprehension of God. Long had Satan sought to lead men to look upon their creator as the author of sin and suffering and death. Those whom he had thus deceived imagined that God was hard and exacting. They regarded him as watching to denounce and condemn, unwilling to receive the sinner, so long as there was a legal excuse for not helping him. The law of love by which heaven is ruled had been misrepresented by the arch deceiver as a restriction upon men's happiness, a burdensome yoke from which they should be glad to escape. But we are now looking from this end of history. We can see clearly that when the Messiah came, he offered the glorious light of salvation. So what did the Jews in Jesus' day do with those prophecies in Isaiah 9 and 11? Jim? In the later centuries of Israel's history, prior to the first advent, it was generally understood that the coming of the Messiah was referred to in the prophecy. Speaking about that particular prophecy. Prophets of Kings, page Six, 688 and 689. Okay. We have already noticed all the things that Old Testament prophets have spoken about the coming Messiah. Could we ever deteriorate again into a condition where people claiming to be God's faithful people are consulting wizards, the occult, and mediums? Wow, I certainly hope not. But things are going to get worse, so we know that for sure. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have come together for, in this opportunity to discuss your truth, the, the words that are so meaningful to us that, that hold them is so precious. We, we're thankful for your coming the first time. We look forward to the coming of the second time and, and even to the third time. May we understand those events clearly. May we understand what we have studied from the book of Isaiah as our prayer in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Yeah.